Hello and welcome to We On Live broadcast from Washington, D.C. I'm Simon Marks. In this bulletin, we'll get you the day's biggest developments from war-torn Afghanistan and also other stories developing around the world. First, all the day's top headlines. An MI-24 attack helicopter gifted by India to Afghan forces falls into the hands of the Taliban. Pictures reveal the chopper to be in a dilapidated condition, with even the engine apparently missing. The Taliban make fresh territorial advances on the ground, but its representatives in Doha claim they are committed to the path of negotiation. The Afghan government accuses the Taliban of only wanting to achieve its goals through violence. The best way I can help now is if I step aside and let government get back to governing. The embattled New York governor, Andrew Cuomo, announces his resignation in the wake of a bombshell investigation accusing him of sexually harassing 11 women. The U.S. calls for the immediate release of Canadian Michael Spavor, sentenced to 11 years in jail today by a Chinese court. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says Spavor and his compatriot Michael Kovig must be released immediately and unconditionally. Wildfires kill at least 65 people in Algeria, including 28 soldiers. Algeria joins a string of country, countries to be hit by major blazes in recent weeks, fanned by sweltering temperatures and bone-dry conditions. Even as southern parts of Turkey battle wildfires, flash floods ravage Sinop province in the north. Dramatic pictures show a house collapsing as floodwaters inundate streets. And after signing a two-year contract with Paris Saint-Germain, Lionel Messi attends his first official PSG press conference. He says he's dreaming of winning a fifth Champions League with his new teammates. Now the Democrats-controlled U.S. Senate has passed a sweeping $1.2 trillion dollar infrastructure bill. The White House says the legislation is historic. It calls for a massive investment in the nation's roads, highways, bridges and transit projects. The trillion dollar package could become America's biggest infrastructure investment in decades. For President Joe Biden, the bill has been a personal quest. One of the key pledges he made during his campaign was to pass infrastructure legislation with bipartisan support from Democrats and Republicans alike. Biden thanked the Republicans who voted in favor of the bill, 19 of them. The final vote in the Senate was 69 to 30 in the 100-seat chamber. As you all know, just a short while ago, the United States Senate passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the very legislation I ran on when I announced my candidacy for the nomination for president. A historic investment the nation's roads and highways, bridges and transit. So let's look at what reforms the bill will bring in if it's now passed by the House of Representatives and signed into law by the president. Roads, highways, bridges and transit projects will benefit heavily from the investment. The federal initiative will help the elderly secure easier access to health care facilities. 
More families will be able to afford early childhood education and community colleges will become tuition free. The bill will also help the country's drinking water systems and its environmental cleanup. The president says the proposal will significantly reduce carbon emissions that have been rising due to climate change. But experts are warning that there will be an economic fallout. The bill is expected to increase federal budget deficits by more than $250 billion over 10 years. However, Democrats seem optimistic. Millions of lead pipes carrying drinking water to our homes and schools and daycare centers are finally going to repl be replaced. Never again can we allow what happened in Flint, Michigan and Jackson, Mississippi. Can never let it happen again. High-speed internet going to be available and affordable everywhere to everyone. So farmers nationwide can get the best prices for their products at home and abroad by knowing when to sell. And children in Chicago or Philadelphia never have to again sit in the McDonald's parking lot to do their homework. This is transformational. After the infrastructure bill, the Senate Democrats are now bracing to pass a proposed $3.5 trillion budget, which is to be spent on Biden's Build Back Better priorities like health care and climate change. Both bills still require passage in the House of Representatives. And the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, has made it clear that her chamber will only consider the bills together. That means that months of work remain before the historic infrastructure bill reaches the president's desk to be signed into law. In one of the most stunning falls in modern American politics, the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, a prominent Democrat, has stepped down, succumbing to an expanding sexual harassment scandal, which led most of his aides to abandon him. Andrew Cuomo's dramatic fall was shocking. It marks the end of a political dynasty in New York and the beginning of a chaotic and uncertain chapter in the politics of the state. Let's take a look at the details. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo on Tuesday surrendered to the wave of scandals which left him facing possible impeachment and announced his resignation. I think that given the circumstances, the best way I can help now is if I step aside and let government get back to governing. And therefore that's what I'll do. Because I work for you and doing the right thing is doing the right thing for you. Because as we say, it's not about me, it's about we. The decision came a week after New York's Attorney General released the results of an investigation that found Cuomo sexually harassed at least 11 women. While the governor apologized to the women, he continued to deny intentionally mistreating them. The most serious allegations made against me had no credible factual basis in the report. And there is a difference between alleged improper conduct and concluding sexual harassment. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not to say that there are not 11 women who I truly offended. There are. And for that, I deeply, deeply apologize. Cuomo maintained that the pressure for his ouster is politically motivated. Even after announcing his resignation of moves which may have reportedly avoided an impeachment, Andrew Cuomo is still facing ongoing criminal investigations and may also face a lawsuit by one of his accusers. Prosecutors in at least five New York state counties have launched separate criminal probes following the AG report. Cuomo and his aides are also facing investigation into allegations they misled the public and federal authorities about deaths in nursing homes linked to the coronavirus pandemic, and that state resources were misused by Cuomo as he authored his pandemic memoir. 
A self-proclaimed progressive Democrat, Cuomo highlighted some of his administration's progress on Tuesday, from legalizing gay marriage to beginning to lift the minimum wage to $15 and expanded paid family leave benefits. The governor also backed big infrastructure projects across New York State. Since 2016, Andrew Cuomo is the third New York governor to leave in disgrace. His predecessor, Elliot Spitzer, resigned following a prostitution scandal, and David Patterson before him didn't seek re-election due to corruption allegations. Susan Tehrani from New York for We On, World is One. There's been more grim news from Afghanistan today, where the Taliban continues to expand its control of territory. Taliban terrorists have seized two more Afghan cities. Tens of thousands of people have fled their homes in a bid to find safe haven. In the latest developments, the Taliban captured the city of Faizabad in northern Afghanistan. It's the ninth provincial capital that has fallen to the Taliban in less than a week. According to one Afghan lawmaker, Afghan security forces and the Taliban have engaged in intense fighting in the region for the last few days, and both sides have suffered heavy losses. Earlier, the Taliban made another strategic capture by taking control of Puli Kumri, the capital of Baglan province. It's located just 200 kilometers north of the capital, Kabul. Afghan lawmaker Mamour Ahmadzai said that after about two hours of fighting, the security forces were overpowered and retreated. The Taliban have also taken control of Farah city, which is located in the west of the country. The governor's office and police headquarters were also captured. The city of Kunduz, which is around 300 kilometers north of Kabul, has completely been taken over by the Taliban. Hundreds of Afghan soldiers who retreated to the airport outside Kunduz after the city fell to the Taliban have now surrendered. In Kandahar, in the south of the country, Afghan forces countered the Taliban's offensives with an airstrike. Afghanistan's defense ministry claims that 25 Taliban terrorists were killed and uh, several were wounded in the strike. The video of the strike was posted online by the defense ministry. Meanwhile, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani has flown to the northern city of Mazari Sharif. An official statement says he's checking the general security situation in the northern zone. He's likely to hold talks with Mazar's longtime strongman to discuss the defense of the city. This comes as the Taliban terrorists continue to inch closer to the city's outskirts. India has repatriated 50 of its nationals from Mazari Sharif. A special flight arrived in New Delhi early this morning. India has evacuated diplomats from its consulate in Mazari Sharif as the Taliban continues to expand control. Around 1,500 Indian nationals are involved in various development works in Afghanistan. Weon, of course, has been relentlessly reporting from the heart of the conflict as the Taliban inches closer to Mazari Sharif. If the city falls to the terrorists, it will mean the Afghan government has effectively lost control of the north of the country. Weon correspondent Anas Malik reports now from Ground Zero, sending us this report from Mazari Sharif. I'm standing in Pulima Bukhri. Uh, the area behind me, if my camera person can follow as well, these are the undeclared or unmarked boundaries that are that of the Taliban. The roadblock that you see, that is marked. That is a territory that is marked, that is off, uh, that is assumed of the Taliban. You can hear there is intermittent firing that is ongoing uh, and there is use of heavy weapon as well. There is use of heavy mach machinery by the Afghan army. This is just the outskirts of mazar sharif city. Uh, there is a renewed offensive by the Taliban that has been lodged and this is a bid to push back the Taliban from entering Mazar city. Anas Malik in Mazar-e-Sharif for Vion, World is One.
Now here in Washington, President Joe Biden has once again been defending his decision to withdraw troops from Afghanistan. His comments were made at the White House at a time when the security situation on the ground in the country is rapidly deteriorating and the number of casualties is rising. The president said the U.S. will keep its commitment to provide air support, but Afghan leaders, he said, must come together and fight for themselves. No. Look. We spent over a trillion dollars, over 20 years. We trained and equipped with modern equipment over 300,000 Afghan forces. And Afghan leaders have to come together. We lost thousands, lost death and injury, thousands of American personnel. They've got to fight for themselves, fight for their nation. The United States, I'll insist we continue to keep the commitments we made of providing close air support, making sure that their Air Force functions and is operable, res resupplying their forces with food and equipment, and paying all their salaries. And, uh, but we're going to continue to keep our commitment. But I do not regret my decision. Meanwhile, it's reported here today that the president has been warned by his intelligence agencies to expect the Taliban to reach Kabul and overthrow the Afghan government within the next 90 days. Meanwhile, a multilateral meeting on the peace process in Afghanistan was held in Doha today. It was attended by the U.S. envoy to Afghanistan, Zalmay Khalilzad, along with attendees from the United Nations, China, the U.K., Pakistan, Uzbekistan and the European Union. The participating parties called for a political settlement to achieve enduring peace in the war-torn country. All representatives agreed a political solution through negotiation is the only way forward for Afghanistan. Later today, the Troika will meet, involving the US, China, Russia and Pakistan. India, Indonesia and Turkey will also participate in a regional conference on the Afghan situation in Doha on Thursday. An advisor to the Afghan National Security Council, Javid Faisal, has said that peace is the Afghan government's top priority. As the Taliban continues its offensive, the Afghan Security Council vowed not just to recapture fallen territory, but also to protect Afghan citizens. You cannot negotiate with someone who does not believe in negotiations. Uh, they just believe in one thing. War, war, and war. And what war brings? Death, destruction, failure. Uh, and it kills the prospects for peace. Uh, so that's why we are calling on the Taliban and their advisors, the countries behind them, uh, to come to the peace talks. Now, on this very day, August the 11th, 18 years ago, a NATO-led mission began in Afghanistan. Today, almost two decades on, there is little to celebrate. Afghanistan is once again war-torn and conflict-ridden, and the security situation in the country is deteriorating with each passing day. The International Security Assistance Force, ISAF, was one of the largest military coalitions in history. But today, it's left behind a troubled legacy in Afghanistan. One hundred thirty thousand troops, fifty one countries, seven hundred military bases. We are talking about the erstwhile International Security Assistance Force, now known as NATO. The NATO-led mission in Afghanistan was one of the largest coalitions in history. It was also the bloc's most challenging mission. The ISAF took charge in 2003 with an aim to train the Afghan Defense Forces and provide security in and around capital Kabul. But throughout its deployment in the war-torn nation, the alliance was involved in battles with the Taliban, especially after 2006. From 2011, it started shifting the responsibility of security arrangements to the Afghan forces. 
NATO's Afghan operations ceased in late 2014. The NATO handed over charge to a US-led non-combat mission called the Resolute Support. At its height, the NATO carried out operations in almost the whole of Afghanistan. The mission was aimed at assisting nation-building. But the reality on the ground is different. Instead of strengthening key institutions, Afghanistan is now on the verge of a civil war, with Taliban terrorists gaining ground in the country. The Afghan army, which was assisted by the NATO, is struggling to fight against the Taliban. One thing is clear, the troops lack both training and weapons. But U.S. President Joe Biden has made it clear that his country does not regret its withdrawal from Afghanistan. I think they're beginning to realize they've got to come together politically at the top. And, uh, but we're going to continue to keep our commitment. But I do not regret my decision. NATO also maintains that it has provided ample support to the Afghan forces. This is an indication that the U.S. and NATO are unlikely to provide any substantial military assistance to the Afghan army. As for the ISAF, it has become part of history, leaving behind a legacy of what some call a failed mission. Bureau Report, we on World is One. Relations between Canada and China have hit rock bottom after a Chinese court jailed Canadian businessman Michael Spaver for 11 years. He was found guilty of espionage. Canada has condemned the Chinese court judgment and is calling the case politically motivated. The court in Dandong said that Spaver was convicted of espionage and illegally provided state secrets. Spaver was detained three years ago, along with his compatriot Michael Kovrig, on what Canada has said are trumped-up charges. They were both detained after Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou was arrested in Canada on a U.S. extradition warrant. Both countries have accused each other of politicizing the legal cases. Entrepreneur Spaver and Kovrig, who is a former diplomat, were formally charged with spying in June of last year, and their separate trials took place this last March. The pair have had almost no contact with the outside world since their detention. Canadian diplomats who were barred from entering Spaver's three-hour trial in March were present for today's verdict and sentencing. We condemn in the strongest possible terms this decision rendered after a legal process that lacked both fairness and transparency. Our thoughts are with Michael and his family uh, during this difficult time. Uh, we've maintained from the beginning that Michael Spaver and Michael Kovrig are being detained arbitrarily and we will continue to call for their immediate release and we will continue to work tirelessly to secure their freedom. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau condemned the sentence, calling it unacceptable and unjust. Trudeau also said that the trial violated the minimum standards required by international law. While Beijing insisted that the detention of the two Canadians is lawful, it calls Meng's case a purely political incident. Meng's extradition hearings began in Canada last week, taking place in the city of Vancouver, after nearly three years of court battles and diplomatic sparring. Meng is the daughter of Chinese tech giant Huawei's founder and CEO, Ren Zhengfei. She is fighting extradition to the United States, where she's accused of defrauding HSBC Bank by misrepresenting the relationship between Huawei and Skycom, a subsidiary that sold telecoms equipment to Iran. That deal put HSBC in jeopardy because it risks breaching U.S. sanctions against Tehran. Meng's legal team deny the allegations and maintain that the U.S. case is flawed. Soccer superstar Lionel Messi has arrived at his new club, PSG. Messi says he now wants to build something special with Paris Saint-Germain 
and help his new club become the champions of Europe. The 34-year-old has signed a two-year deal with PSG with the option of an additional year. The Argentine forward will wear the number 30 jersey in Paris. That is the same number he had when he began his professional career at Barcelona. He says he's eager to start this new chapter in his career. I am very eager and excited to start training. Honestly, I want this to pass quickly. I'm enjoying the move so far with my family, with my friends, but I really want to start training because I really want to get to know my teammates and the coaching staff and start this new phase. Messi waved to crowds while sporting a Paris t-shirt on his arrival at the airport before being taken away for a routine medical examination. The completion of his move closes a whirlwind few days after the announcement last Thursday that he would leave Barcelona, the club he represented for the entirety of his 17-year professional career. PSG was about the only club that could afford what is reported to be a deal worth 35 million euros a year. I am very happy. Everyone knows how I left Barcelona a few days ago. It was really hard because I spent many years there and it's hard to make a move after so long. But as soon as I arrived here, I felt extremely happy. Messi leaves Barcelona with 672 goals, scored in 778 appearances, a record tally for one club. He won 35 trophies at the Camp Nou after joining Barcelona aged just 13. His trophy hall includes four Champion Leagues and ten La Liga titles. He also won the Ballon d'Or for the world's best player a record six times. PSG have already added veteran Spanish defender Sergio Ramos from Real Madrid and Italy's Euro 2020 winning goalkeeper Donna Rumna from AC Milan. Messi's arrival boosts an already impressive lineup featuring France's World Cup star Kylian Mbappé and Brazilian striker Neymar. There had been questions over Mbappé's future, but with Messi's arrival, PSG's president says the player has no reason to leave. I think everyone knows Kylian Mbappé's future. He's a Parisian, he's a Parisian player. Kylian is very competitive. He has the hunger to win. He has said publicly that he wants a competitive team. I don't think there's any team more competitive than ours now. That means he has no excuse to do anything else. Thank you. I think I'm joining a team that is practically complete, beyond the big signings arriving this season. In the last few years, this club has come very close to winning the Champions League. I can help by trying to give it my all. I've come here with a lot of energy and drive. My goal and my dream is to win another Champions League and that's what we will try to do. You know, there were 50,000 people online monitoring Lionel Messi's flight as he headed to Paris from Barcelona. That is all we have for you today on Weon's live broadcast from Washington, D.C. I'm Simon Marks. For more global news and updates, stay tuned to Weon. World is one.